reason that we believe Christianity is true is because the answer to four questions is yes. And here, my fellow apes, are those four questions. One, were you born in a majority Christian country? Yes. Two, will you accept the reliability of an ancient collection of books saturated with contradictions and atrocities? Yes. Three, will you misrepresent science for Jesus? Yes. And finally, four, from the low price of just $7,599 per person, will you go on exquisite cruises through Midian, Jephro, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel? Yes. Well then, lucky goose, the kingdom of heaven is bestowed upon thou. If you answer those four questions in the affirmative, because there's evidence that the answer to those four questions is yes, then Christianity's true. As I'm sure most of you are aware, the Christian apologist Frank Turek has for many a year been battling the evil atheist professors of the world. Those atheistic college professors. And consequently, he has a vast ocean of gish gallop for poor sods like me to clear up. And like all prolific apologists, Turek has several sermons, or apologetic preachings, at his disposal, and I plan to respond to his most popular, starting with his four reasons why Christianity is true. Here are the four questions you need to answer to show that Christianity is true. The first question is, does truth exist? The second question is, does God exist? The third question is, are miracles possible? And the fourth question is, the New Testament and therefore the Bible true? If you answer those four questions in the affirmative, because there's evidence that the answer to those four questions is yes, then Christianity's true. In pursuit of maximal charitability, I've trailed through several of Turek's presentations of this preaching, and have combined them to present the strongest possible case in his favour. For instance, in the short and punchy presentation, he is scripted and fast more precise in his language, but in the graduation presentation, he provides greater detail with additional content. What you'll see here is the best of all presentations. What's more, for the purpose of being thorough, I'm going to break my response into four parts. I appreciate that this might appear unwarranted, but like it or not, the only way to comprehensively clear up the gish gallop is to invest the necessary time and attention. So, with that, Let's get to the first question. How about the first question, does truth exist? Does truth exist? You may hear people say there is no truth, you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Obviously you hear people say all the time, there is no truth, or you got your truth, I got my truth, all truth is relative. Except you don't hear people say this all the time, do you? People say all the time. Which explains, of course, why Tarek doesn't provide any examples. Whilst there are many theories of truth, the vast majority of people, be them religious or non-religious, subscribe to the correspondence theory of truth. They say that if some claim correlates with reality, with facts, then it's true. For instance, when someone says that the Earth is an ellipsoid, they are asserting that in reality, as a fact, the Earth is an ellipsoid. Now, the way in which people justify their truth claims is a question of epistemology. It's a question of how they know a given proposition is true. And thus, when someone calls into question the truth claims of, say, the resurrection of Jesus, or Muhammad split the moon, or Hercules slayed the Linnean Hydra, they are not stating that there is no truth, or you've got your truth of the Hydra once existing, and I've got my truth of the Hydra never existing, but rather that we don't have the extraordinary justification required to believe such extraordinary claims. There's more to be said here, of course, but before doing so, let's hear the rest of Turek's argument. When somebody says there is no truth, you ought to ask that person a question. But if someone were to ever say to you there is no truth, you should ask that person a question. What should the question be? This is the interactive portion of the program. School's not over. Go! You ought to say, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. Yeah, you'd say, how is that true? Or, is that true? Is it true that there is no truth? Because if it's true that there is no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. <laughs> Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation. Oh, Turek, you give the world intellectual constipation. And that's a truth claim that we have ample epistemic reason to believe. In other words, it's a self-defeating claim. If somebody says there is no truth, that claim doesn't meet its own standard because that very claim claims to be true. It's like saying I can't speak a word in English. If I were to say I can't speak a word in English, you'd go, huh? Or it's like saying my parents had no kids that lived. Or it's like saying my brother is an only child. Or it's like saying, everything I say is a lie. <laughs> Some of you will get that tomorrow. <laughs> or it's like saying, all generalizations are false. Some of you will never get that one. 
Indeed, it's like saying that I'm a married bachelor. It's definitionally impossible to be a married bachelor, just as it's definitionally impossible for the proposition there is no truth to be true. No doubt, Turek has made short and comedic work of this weak argument, but to what end? If, on the one hand, Turek is aware that objective truth is compatible with the vast majority of religious and irreligious worldviews, then his first question serves as little more than rhetoric and sophistry. It butters up the audience to his charisma and charm, but it conveys nothing of intellectual value. His first question may as well be, is the world you experience real? Because, obviously, Obviously, you hear people say all the time that we're in the Matrix. While it might be the case that a bunch of postmodernists will claim that the world we experience isn't real, and a similar fringe group will claim that there is no truth, there is no spoon. the vast majority of people, and especially the most prominent critics of religion, don't say this. So, to reiterate, on the one hand this first question of Turek serves as chiefly rhetoric. But if, on the other hand, Turek believes that this claim is frequently made by the critics of Christianity, then, well, he's at best not been paying attention, and in any case he's emboldening the ignorance of his flock. From Hitchens to Dawkins to Shermer to O'Connor, critics of the truth claims of Christianity don't assume the self-refuting position that there is no truth, but rather emphasise that we simply do not have the extraordinary evidence required to justify the extraordinary claims of Christianity. Here's how the English philosopher John Hawthorne, who's currently serving as Professor of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne, succinctly puts the epistemic question in regards to Abrahamic religion. Even if there is a God, take the best case scenario right. for the theist as it were, right. there is a God, uh, God made the world, God uh, appeared to Moses, Moses wrote some stuff down, right. supposing that's all, all right, all true, should we conclude people in the good case scenario know that there's right. a God by, say, reading the, the, the bits of scripture. I mean, there are some arguments designed to show that even in the good case scenario, you're irrational. <laughs> I mean, if I have a box and there's a beetle in the box and you can't see in the box, you'd be irrational to believe that there's a beetle in the box, <laughs> even if it's right. What I like about Hawthorne's beetle example is that it simply and effectively illustrates the difference between truth and rationality. Even if it were the case, even if it were true that there's a beetle in the box, if you don't have epistemic justification for believing there's a beetle in the box, you'd be irrational, unjustified in believing what is, in fact, the truth. Another example I've used in the past is the shape of the earth. Despite it being an ellipsoid, our ancient ancestors, who didn't have access to the evidence and data that we do today, would have been irrational to believe that the earth is an ellipsoid. Now to contextualise this in relation to strictly Christianity, even if it were the case that Jesus was the Son of God, that he performed all of the acclaimed miracles, assuming this is all true, that it's all factual, here's the epistemic question. Are we, today, reading translations of translations of contradictory accounts written by anonymous authors many moons after the supposed extraordinary events, and in mutual exclusivity with the extraordinary claims of many other religions, justified in believing such claims? The honest answer is no, absolutely not. Even if the claims of Christianity were true, we would not be justified in believing that it's true as the evidence we have is shockingly poor. What's more, an all-knowing, omniscient God would know this, and if it was also all-loving, omnibenevolent, it certainly wouldn't threaten hell upon those that, earnestly using the brain that it gave them, are not convinced by the evidential disarray. Or to flip the script, if the kingdom of God is reserved only for those that use their brain, then, by divine irony, the residents are chiefly atheists. Or, at least they were before they expired. Because then you get, you get all the Christians dead. And then a load of bitter atheists going, and worst of all, I was wrong. <laughs> so, to reiterate, Tarek employs his first big question either for the purpose of rhetoric, or because he doesn't understand the truth claim objections of non-Christians. Considering that, at least as far as I've seen, he's never employed this smackdown argument against a prominent atheist during a debate, I'm going to assume the former, that it's all for show. These are self-defeating statements. You're going to hear this. All truth comes from science. Now, in the graduation presentation, Tarek kindly provides us with extra intellectual constipation by conjuring and then hastily defeating yet another weak argument. All truth comes from science. What question would you ask somebody who says that? Yeah, does that truth come from science? No, it doesn't come from science at all. It's a philosophical claim. You couldn't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. You couldn't understand the Bible or the newspaper without philosophy. So don't let them 
snow you. Whilst it's entirely possible that Tarek has bumped into someone who has genuinely maintained that all truth comes from science, this strikes me as a straw man of the very popular sentiment that science is the best path to truth. Which also manifests in such quotes as... The good thing about science is that it's true whether or not you believe in it. It's always irked me that the religious so easily utilise the extraordinary value of science when it comes to health and technology, taking full advantage of the cornerstones of science that is rigorous scepticism and empirical methodology, but so easily dismiss science under the rubric of scientism when it contradicts their barbaric mythology. The philosopher and cognitive scientist Dr Daniel Dennett has referred to this scientism dismissal as an all-purpose wildcard smear. Calling a spade a spade, he says that when someone puts forward a scientific theory that they, the religious, don't like, they just try to discredit it as scientism. But when it comes to facts, and explanation of facts, science is the only game in town. Anyhow, there's my response to Tarek's first reason why Christianity is true. In a nutshell, it serves as little more than sophistry. To those unaware of the truth claim objections against Christianity, it paints the illusion of Tarek being an intellectual and comedic juggernaut. But to those who are aware of the truth claim objections against Christianity, it comes across as sophistry and, honestly, really quite weird. You're like a bit weird. Now in the next episode, the intellectual constipation goes into overdrive as the gish galloping accelerates to the next level. And I must say that if that hasn't enticed you to hit the subscribe button, then I don't think I'm ever going to win you over. As always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and those of you who have supported the channel via other means. Together, we are fighting against the propaganda of apologetics, and we are, as a whole, having tremendous success. If you support me, or any other sceptical YouTubers, podcasters, authors, etc., know that your generosity really is making a difference. Until next time, my fellow apes. Until next time.